to do when we look at dating methods to try and get how old the Earth is, we need to see how good that dating method meets all of these conditions. So with that in mind, let's talk about a few dating methods that have been used to look at the age of the Earth to try and figure out uh, what science has to say. Now one of the most interesting ones to me is uh, the amount of sodium we find in the ocean. The reason this is interesting to me is it's probably the dating method that has been longest studied. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton was the first to suggest that this would be a way to measure the age of the Earth. And we've been studying this process ever since. So of all the dating methods that at least I've found, this one's the one that's been studied the longest. Does that make it the best? No. You know, but at least we know a lot about it because we've studied it for quite some time. Well, it turns out if you look at the ocean, you'll find that sodium, uh, one of the ions, in so the sodium ion from, uh, from salt, enters the ocean in, very, in certain ways. Rivers dump sodium into the ocean. Uh, surface runoff scrapes sodium off the uh, topsoil and brings it into the ocean. Groundwater flows underneath the ground and ends up uh, dumping into the ocean. And, and ocean sediments tend to release sodium over time. These are the basic ways that sodium gets into the ocean. Sodium also leaves the ocean. Uh, when the waves spray, the droplets will go off onto land. The droplets evaporate, leaving the, leaving the salt behind. Uh, clays in the ocean absorb salt. Se not only are sediments releasing salt, but under certain conditions, sediments can trap salt as well. So they're both giving and taking salt, depending on the situation. There's a very specific type of mineral called zeolite that can absorb salt pretty well. And those are the basic ways that sodium enters and leaves the ocean. Well, we've been studying this for quite some time, so you can make some pretty detailed measurements. And you find that throughout the several hundred years as this has been studied, sodium has been entering the oceans faster than it's leaving. So in the end, the ocean is getting more and more salty, having more and more sodium in it. Well, if you believe that these rates have stayed pretty constant over time, and we don't know that they have, we know they have over the hundred years as we've been studying this, but, you know, we haven't been studying it for a lot longer than that, so they could have changed. But if you believe these rates are fairly constant, then this is a possible dating method, assuming some initial condition. We know how fast sodium's building up in the ocean, but how much sodium was in there to begin with? Well, we don't know, so let's just assume, for the purposes of discussion, that there was originally no salt in the ocean. And it's these processes of sodium entering and leaving that have built up the level of sodium that's there today. If that's the case, then the uh, uh, ocean can't be any more than 62 million years old. Now that's one way of dating the Earth. The problem is, our assumptions, we have no idea about this one. We have no idea about whether the uh, um, uh, level of salt in the ocean was zero initially. And we have no idea whether these rates have stayed constant over this 62 million year period if it's been going on that long. But nevertheless, for at least a couple hundred years, they've been pretty constant, so maybe they're constant. If anything, this might be considered an upper, upper limit. Because if the ocean started out salty, then this number would go down. If the ocean started out with some salt, it would take less time for them to get to their level now. So you might look at this as a possible upper limit for the age of the Earth. So that's one dating method one can use for the Earth. Are there others? Yeah. And in fact, some of them are probably a little better. I think this one is probably a little better simply because we know things a little better in this case. Um, we can, we can uh, look at how much helium is in the atmosphere. Uh, helium is a light gas. It's produced mostly by radioactive decay in the Earth's crust. Now what, whoops, I just lost something. That's bad. Okay. Under control. Now what's nice about helium is it's very unreactive. Under normal conditions, it simply doesn't react. So once the helium is made by radioactive decay, there's really not much that can happen to it. It can either be trapped in the rocks and so forth where it's made, or it can escape the rocks and enter Earth's atmosphere. If it enters Earth's atmosphere, it's going to float up to the top of the atmosphere, and if it has enough kinetic energy when it reaches the edges of the atmosphere, it can escape. Now. But the nice thing about this is we've studied this pretty, uh, pretty in depth, and since helium doesn't have any reactivity, there's not a lot of other things that can happen to it. We know the rate of helium production, at least in recent years anyway, we know the rate of helium production because it's based on the rate of radioactive decay, the amount of radioactive isotopes, and the rate at which helium gets out of the rocks if it's trapped there. These are well measured and well understood. 
The rate of escape, if the helium gets out to the top of the atmosphere, is based on the energy distribution of heliums in the atmosphere, and that's very un well understood too. The result is, once again, if you assume that there was no helium in the atmosphere today, um, and you wanted these processes to build up the level of helium that we see, then in the end, the atmosphere can't be more than two million years old. Now, once again, this is an upper limit because it assumes there's no helium in the atmosphere to begin with. Uh, and this number is probably a little closer, uh, in my opinion, to being uh, legitimate, simply because there's nothing much else that helium will do. So we don't have a lot of ways to, to get rid of the helium other than these processes. So in the end, once again, we've got a rate at which helium is building up in the atmosphere. We've studied the rate for a while. Seems to be constant. Assuming no helium, you get an age of 2 million years. Once again, that's an upper limit. So that's another method for dating the age of the Earth. There are lots of other methods we can use. One of the more reliable ones, it's not very applicable, but it's incredibly reliable, is dendrochronology. That's the $20 word for tree ring dating. If you cut open a tree, you know, cut across, a, cut a tree down, and you look at a, a cross section of it, you'll see that the tree grows in rings. And it turns out, in general, these rings are made once a year. So if you count the number of rings, you can count how old the tree is. Turns out if you do that to a bunch of living trees, the oldest tree you can find uh, using this method is, as of this year, 4,771 uh, 4, years old. It's a, a type of tree called a bristlecone pine, and they don't look like much. You think of these old trees as being sequoias that have been growing for thousands. It turns out that <laughs> these trees here are thousands of years old. They don't look very impressive, but they're, they're, they're that old. And it turns out the oldest one you can find uh, using dendrochronology is just, uh, just under 5,000 years old. Um, now, the problem with this is there's no theoretical limit on the age of a bristlecone pine. A lot of organisms have a theoretical limit on age. We don't have one for bristlecone pines. They ought to live for quite a long time, a lot more than 5,000 years. The problem is, why don't you find more of them? Um, if, if the Earth really is very, very old, you would expect you could find bristlecone pines that are a lot older than this. Now, the problem is this isn't really a dating method for the Earth, because we don't know that, that the oldest uh, bristlecone pine we can find, they call him Methuselah, we don't know that Methuselah was around at the beginning. So we don't know that this is a, uh, a dating method for the Earth, but it gives us some perspective. It gives us some perspective because if our previous dating method, for example, was right, and the Earth is 2 million years old, if the Earth's been sitting around for 2 million years, and these trees have been growing for a good fraction of those 2 million years, and they don't have any upper limit on their age, why don't you find older ones? Um, so even though this isn't necessarily a dating method, it gives us a range of, uh, of probability. Now, interestingly enough, you can actually try and extend dendrochronology back to trees that are dead. This is possible. It's, kind of, it's quite hard to do. Uh, the idea is certain climactic conditions will cause a pattern of tree rings to emerge that seem to be based on the climate. And if I find a living tree that has that pattern, and then I find a fossil tree, fossilized tree, that seems to have that same pattern, if I line those two patterns up, I can say, okay, the living tree gives me a count of age up to the pattern, and then the fossilized tree gives me a count of age farther down. The problem with that is there have been lots of attempts to do that, and no one's had any consistent success. Just two years ago, there was a big one uh, produced by a, a group in the Netherlands, and it was produced by a lot of fanfare and a year later retracted because it contradicted another one that they decided was more accurate. Uh, so in the end, that's kind of fraught with peril. If we just go with what's living, we find that the living organisms, even though there's not any theoretical limit on their age, seem to be on the order of 5,000 years old. That's strange if the Earth is incredibly old. Now this is probably my favorite dating method. The reason it's my favorite dating method is it made a lot of predictions uh, about things that weren't known, and those predictions turned out later on to be accurate. In addition, um, uh, this is the, uh, one of the theory I'm going to describe here is the only theory that properly describes magnetic fields in the solar system. Uh, and so as a result, I think it's an interesting because not only does it apply to Earth, but it can apply to basically any planet in the solar system. We start with the idea that Earth